Hey everyone, it's Austin again, back with another video for Human Ideals. This is the third and final entry to the three-part series on communication and culture. Now, this video is going to be similar to the last essay I did with Marvel's Cloak and Dagger, where we're talking about shared emotion and redeeming uh, emotional transmutation. So this is basically about uh, challenging the shared emotion in social inequity. It's basically uh, about glorifying the suffering of vulnerable groups and the dynamic between privilege and vulnerable groups. We often think of uh, trying to empathize with another, the notion of empathy itself as being inherently hegemonic or coercive, sort of like an ideological state apparatus, uh, as I mentioned in the first essay. But here we're uh, trying to challenge that belief. And so there's basically multiple stages to this, right, where um, the glorification of suffering uh, in vulnerable groups where privileged people try to empathize with the other um, creates this sort of uh, distance. And this distance, even though privileged groups may think that they're uh, really getting really close, you know, becoming more and more approximated to the suffering of vulnerable uh, vulnerable groups, uh, this assumption is unchallenged. It's like a self-imagined proximity. But then this is often overcompensated for by vulnerable groups thinking that, oh, any form, uh, any attempt to, you know, empathize with their suffering is, you know, inherently classes, inherently hegemonic. But then uh, there's also a final stage where uh, in compensation for this, privileged people uh, feel guilty and, you know, they unknowingly glorify the suffering of the vulnerable to compensate for their deficiencies. And this essay is basically about challenging these stages and asking the question about whether harmonizing emotional perspectives between privilege and vulnerable groups in any form of social movement uh, is actually possible and whether empathy can be truly reformed or whether empathy is present uh, in these forms of uh, in these dynamics between the privileged and vulnerable, whether empathy is present to begin with. So anyways, I hope you guys enjoy this final entry to the three-part communication and culture series titled To Reform Empathy to Redeem Shared Emotion. Ideologies aimed at alleviating social inequity often rely on shared emotions between identity groups. This is the case since ideology is the set of shared beliefs, assumptions, norms, and values held by a certain community. An underlying assumption is that the privileged will be able to fully empathize with the hardships of more vulnerable groups. However, Innocent Amusements, the stage of sufferance by Saidiya Hartman, shows how embodying the suffering of others may actually eliminate their independent emotional existence. Despite the best of intentions, this self-imagined proximity of the empathizer goes unchallenged. Not only does this reduce the possibility of shared emotional perspective, it posits this shared emotion as being inherently hegemonic, whereby vulnerable groups are subjugated in giving away unconscious consent to the abuse of power. This is not to say that such abuses never occur. Sarah Ahmed explores the motives behind this abuse in her work, Killing Joy, Feminism, and the History of Happiness. She illustrates how the coercion of happiness by privileged groups onto the more vulnerable stigmatizes their unhappiness, and that this bars the possibility of more equitable outcomes in the future. In both cases, embodying the other and forcing their well-being signified the need to preserve existing peace between the two groups. This preservation of peace acts as a coping mechanism for the privileged group. It gives them an escape from feeling apathetic in attempting to resolve this inequity. The hegemonic perception of shared emotion is then overcompensated for by glorifying the suffering of the vulnerable. This is depicted in Regarding the Pain of Others by Susan Sontag. However, a reformed empathy, an emotion typically used to preserve peace between these groups, can challenge social inequity beyond these pitfalls by harmonizing emotional perspectives, whereby deconstructing imagined proximities to the suffering of others does not invalidate the shared emotion. Saidiya Hartman starts off by defining empathy as, quote, the projection of one's personality into an object with the attribution to the object of one's own emotions, end quote. 
She gives the example of John Rankin, the well-meaning brother of a slave owner who sets out to convince him on the evils of slavery. He tries to unite his description of embodying the slave's suffering with the emotional perspective of white male readers. However, because his embodiment eliminates the independent experiences of the slaves, empathy is reduced to a hegemonic act, an overtaking of priv privileged emotional perspectives over that of the vulnerable. Quote, Empathy confounds Rankin's efforts to identify with the enslaved, because in making the slave's suffering his own, Rankin begins to feel for himself rather than for those whom this exercise in imagination is presumably designed to reach. End quote. This reveals an assumption that challenges the possibility of reforming empathy. It assumes that this sharing of emotion cannot be used to bridge the imagined proximity itself implying that all expressions of embodying the other lead to their effacement. This dilemma is acknowledged by Hartman herself, quote, If, on one hand, pain extends humanity to the dispossessed, on the other, the spectral and spectacular character of this suffering, the shocking and ghostly presence of pain effaces and restricts black sentience, end quote. However, a reformed empathy would posit this sharing of emotion as a catalyst, a prerequisite for acknowledging the real distance and experiences of inequity. Sarah Ahmed would suggest that these hegemonic consequences are only a symptom of reluctance, an unwillingness to sacrifice existing peace between white slave owners and their slaves. In other words, if vulnerable groups present the distance and actual experiences of inequity to the privileged, empathy can become a cooperative effort for bridging this distance without effacing the vulnerable. Ahmed shows how vulnerable groups face the fear of criticism in trying to expose this distance. The unwillingness to sacrifice existing peace amongst privileged groups confronts the feminist killjoy depicted in Killing Joy, Feminism and the History of Happiness. Ahmed asserts that, quote, The feminist subject in the room brings others down not only by talking about unhappy topics such as sexism, but by exposing how happiness is sustained by erasing the signs of not getting along. The failure to be happy is read as sabotaging the happiness of others, end quote. For the feminist, deconstructing happiness not only challenges norms around the preservation of peace, it directly questions the proper application of empathy. For instance, in the case of sexism, peace between the sexes is sustained through the coercion of happiness in women. Women are expected to be happy through the approval of external figures in their life. Quote, happiness can involve an imminent coercion, usually thought of as an external force that requires the obedience of subjects through the use of threats, intimidation, or pressure. Yet coercion can involve the affirmation or encouragement of a yes. Yes, that will make you happy. You are affirmed because you find the right things pleasing. End quote. Unlike Saidiya Hartman's example of embodying slave suffering, the privileged group of men is not trying to feel the suffering of women for themselves. Instead, the desire to mask underlying feelings of apathy takes precedence over empathy. This is why the shared emotional perspective from coerced happiness substitutes the actual resolving of sexism. Quote, Let us give Emil his Sophie. Let us restore the sweet girl to life and provide her with a less vivid imagination and a happier fate. End quote. In this example, the suppression of Sophie's imagination reveals the belief, fueling their sense of apathy. The belief is that the shared happiness arising from coercion is compa comparable to the result that resulting from material equity in the future. The false similarity between these two forms of shared emotion is different from the illusory proximity of embodying the suffering of others. The exception of men not embodying the suffering of women changes the perspective, purpose of shared emotional perspective. A reformed empathy would reframe the mutual perspective on happiness as the catalyst towards more equitable happiness, rather than being antithetical to said equity, as is the case for sexism. This would not be dismissed as being inherently hegemonic. This shared desire would argue for the superiority of non-coercive happiness, which would then convince the privileged group to sacrifice their existing peace. Quote, happiness involves a kind of intentionality that I would describe as being end-oriented. Some things become happy for us if we imagine they will bring happiness to us.
end quote. Despite the possibility of empathy reform, the perception of hegemony around shared emotion may become even more ingrained. This would only prevent the alleviation of social inequity. In reaction to acknowledging their effacement of vulnerable groups, the privilege may overcompensate by resorting to the opposite extreme of glorifying their suffering. Susan Sontag describes this scopophilic instinct in regarding the pain of others. She asserts that the pleasure of observing depicted crises such as war, disease, <clears throat> or famine creates a distancing effect between the privileged and the vulnerable. Quote, For all the voyeuristic lure and the possible satisfaction of knowing, this is not happening to me. I'm not dying. I'm not trapped in a war. It seems normal for people to fend off thinking about the ordeals of others, even others with whom it would be easy to identify. End quote. This distancing only appears to contradict shared emotional perspective. Similar to embodying the other, glorifying vulnerable group suffering is an attempt by the privileged to feel the emotional burden of said crises within themselves. However, the sharing of emotion in this case carries a different intention compared to embodiment. It masks the helplessness that arise in acknowledging their inability to resolve such crises. This is only exacerbated by self-denial as the privileged group dis dismisses their scopophilic in instincts as immoral. Quote, it is a passage in the Republic, Book 4, where Plato's Socrates describes how our reason may be overwhelmed by an unworthy desire, which drives the self to become angry with the part of its nature. End quote. The glorification of suffering thus bears similarities to the embodiment depicted by Saidiya Hartman and the coping mechanism against apathy illustrated by Sarah Ahmed. A reformed empathy must unite the repurposed shared emotion in both cases to overcome helplessness and self-denial. Bridging the imagined proximity between glorified depictions of suffering, such as staged war photographs, and personal accounts, such as survivors of war, would provide the privilege with greater self-efficacy for cooperating with vulnerable groups, thus clarifying the actual distance and experiences of suffering. This self-efficacy must then be channeled towards dissolving the guilt in self-denial. The privilege must realize the false equivalency between having scopophilic instincts and creating an illusion of equity through coerced happiness, as was the case in Killing Joy, Feminism and the History of Happiness. They must understand that their scopophilic instincts are not the driving force, the factor behind their ha helplessness. Instead, it is the assumptions behind their collective memory of such crises that prevent them from repurposing shared emotion, that frame shared emotion as inherently hegemonic. Quote, what is called collective memory is not a remembering, but a stipulating that this is important, and this is the story about how it happened with the pictures that lock the story within our minds, end quote. Sontag uses the example of American nationalism to show how the ideology of collective memory, being a shared emotional perspective, elevates certain historical details to favor the privileged group. Quote, to have a museum chronicling the great crime that was African slavery in the United States of America would be to acknowledge that the evil was here, Americans preferred a picture that the evil was there, and from which the United States, a unique nation, is exempt. End quote. Unlike the coercion of happiness, the shared emotion and collective memory only shows a lack of accountability in the privileged group. In other words, vulnerable groups are not being directly subjugated. However, in a reformed empathy, the self-efficacy in bridging imagined proximities to suffering and dissolving their self-denial will motivate will motivate the privilege to take accountability. Only then will the perception of inherent hegemony and shared emotion be fully dissolved. Empathy between privileged and vulnerable groups, as commonly conceived, may be inadequate for resolving social inequity. However, it would be misguided to reject empathy entirely as a viable solution towards this goal. Doing so would negate the potential for cooperation between these groups in situations otherwise defined by hegemonic abuses of power. Repurposing shared emotion is essential for mobilizing both groups towards equity, and this must be done without creating further conflict. A reformed empathy must thus accomplish tasks that appear to contradict one another.
it must deconstruct the perception of inherent hegemony in shared emotional perspective while opposing the often hegemonic coercion of emotion in the vulnerable, as this only serves to mask material inequity. This dynamic is captured throughout all the works mentioned above. In Innocent Amusements, The Stage of Sufferance by Saidiya Hartman, shared emotion in embodying the slave's suffering masks the actual distance in experiences of suffering, yet shared emotion can be used to bridge this imagined proximity. The distance between coerced happiness and equitable happiness is similarly bridged in Killing Joy, Feminism and the History of Happiness by Sarah Ahmed. The privileged group can be convinced of the superiority in equitable happiness, motivating them to sacrifice the existing piece of coerced happiness. In Regarding the Pain of Others by Susan Sontag, the privileged overcompensate for the perceived hegemony of shared emotion by glorifying the suffering of vulnerable groups. This is resolved by integrating the solutions above. The bridging of imagined proximities to suffering gives the privileged group more self-efficacy, and the subsequent overcoming of helplessness and self-denial allows them to become accountable for their role in perpetuating inequity. The effectiveness of such reforms depends on whether both groups are unhappy with the extremes of shared emotion. Sarah Ahmed does advocate for allowing unhappiness against the subjugation of vulnerable groups. Yet a reformed empathy requires more than this narrow conception of unhappiness. Both groups must cooperate in transcending the limitations of shared emotion. The unwillingness to redeem shared emotion may be framed as evidence proving the pitfalls of empathy. In reality, this only indicates an incomplete understanding of what empathy entails, if not the absence of true empathy to begin with. Social movements must therefore start by challenging their own preservation of peace, a peace that not only promotes complacency in attempting to fully understand shared emotion, but one that stirs doubt on the possibility of cooperation between privileged and vulnerable groups. All right, guys, so that is the conclusion to the three-part communication and culture miniseries. Now, as you may have noticed, I did not include a real-world example in this essay, mainly because when we were doing it, we weren't required to put a real-world example, but I am going to put in a trailer for this film called 12 Years a Slave, because, um, as I mentioned in the essay, uh, Saidiya Hartman uses the example of Rankin, the brother of a slave owner, who tries to get him to change his ways by basically putting himself in, uh, in the shoes of his slaves, and as an author, he tries to you know, depict their suffering in the most realistic, you know, gut-wrenching way possible. And I think that sort of intensity is really depicted in the narrative of 12 Years a Slave. It's about, you know, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, free slave who tries to, you know, fight for his freedoms. It tries to escape for the plantation. And uh, it's set in the 1800s during the pre-Civil War uh, period in the South. And I remember what, <clears throat> I think it was in ninth grade watching this. It was extremely grueling, but um, yeah, it's such a great film. I love it. But uh, anyways, I'll, um, I hope you guys enjoy the trailer and I'll see you guys in the next video. I want to ask you what part of the country you come from. I originate from Canada. I guess where that is. Oh, I know where Canada is. I've been there myself. Well, travel for a slave. Solomon Northup is an expert player on the violin. I was born a free man. Lived with my family in New York. Be good for your mother. Until the day I was deceived. To Solomon. Kidnapped. Sold into slavery. Well, boy, how you feel now? My name is Solomon North. I'm a free man. And you have no right whatsoever to detain me. You're no free man. You're nothing but a Georgia runaway. We're down to the river Jordan. And that servant that don't obey his lord shall be beaten with many stripes. That's scripture. The condition of your laborers, it's all wrong. They're my property. You say that with pride. I say it as fact. Drink! Man does how he pleases with his property. So
You come here. I said come here! Days ago, I was with my family in my home. Now you tell me all is lost. If you want to survive, do and say as little as possible. My soul arising. Well, I don't want to survive. I want to live. I thought you know something. I did as instructed. There's something wrong. It's wrong with the instruction. Master bought you here to work. Anymore, I'll earn you a hundred lashes. I know what it's like to be the object of Master's mash. No! In his own time, good Lord will manage them all. I will survive! I will not fall into despair! I will keep myself hardy till freedom is opportune! I was a free man. I'm not a slave.